In part five of our journey, our six-week journey on the art of neighboring, hopefully you've been in small groups and and working through the material uh, with them. I've heard a lot of good stories about people uh, and things going on in the small groups. If you have your Bible this morning, turn to 2 Kings chapter 6. We're going to look at a story out of the Old Testament. And I have to warn you in advance, this is kind of a disturbing story. This is not one of the stories that you would want to read to your five-year-old before bedtime. Uh, You know, just letting you know. 2 Kings chapter 6, starting in verse 24. Sometime later, Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, mobilized his entire army and marched up and laid siege to Samaria. So Israel is at war with this nation of Aram. I put a map on the next slide, so let's go to that uh, slide and kind of get an idea. This is actually what Israel looks like today, modern day. Um, And if you see the circle up there where uh, Syria is today, well, that was Aram back uh, two and a half, three thousand years ago. Okay, so they're the enemy. They come down, and they're attacking Samaria, which I put on the map here. Just to give you a little reference, I also put in where Nazareth and Jerusalem are. And so Samaria is actually located in what is present-day the West Bank of uh, Israel, uh, about 30 miles south of Nazareth. Okay, in verse 25 it says, There was a great famine in the city of Samaria. The siege lasted so long that a donkey's head sold for 80 shekels of silver and a quarter of a cab of seed pods for five shekels. So during this siege, the people of Israel run out of food. They become so desperate that a donkey's head was bringing 80 shekels. Now, 80 shekels was about a year's wage for a common laborer. And so that would be like us today paying 20,000 bucks for a donkey's head. That would make for a really expensive dinner. And that's assuming that you would even want to eat a donkey's head, which I would not, unless I was really, really desperate. Now, I I do have to admit that one time when I was in the Navy, I was going through this survival school in the California desert, and we were really hungry. And so I did eat a rabbit's eyeball raw. I I mean, the, the instructor said that it had a lot of good protein, and so I took him on his word, and I ate it. Uh, but uh, I, I would not do that in normal times. This story gets worse in verse 26. As the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried to him, Help me, my lord the king. The king replied, If the lord does not help you, where can I get help for, for you? From the threshing floor? From, from the wine press? He's telling her, Hey, Even I don't have anything. There's no grain to thresh to make bread out of. There's no grapes for the wine press. We've got nothing. Yet, You know, what do you expect to do? I'm not God. I can't create food out of nothing. But he could tell this woman still wanted help. And so then he asked her, what's the matter? She answered, this woman said to me, give up your son so we may eat him today, and tomorrow we'll eat my son. So we cooked my son and ate him. The next day I said to her, Give up your son so we may eat him. But she had hidden him. When the king heard the woman's words, he tore his robes. Now, it is almost impossible for us to even comprehend this kind of situation today. I mean, we think of the lowest form of life on earth as the person who stoops to cannibalism, right? But this is even worse because this woman isn't just a cannibal. She ate her own son. And basically it had gotten to the point of cannibalism or death. These people have no hope. They are starving to death everywhere around the city. The richest people in the city are, are buying donkey's heads for, for enormous prices. And the poor have become cannibals. Well, the king is so angry about this whole situation... He's got to blame it on somebody, so he decides to blame it on Elisha, the prophet of God. And so the king gets some soldiers, and he heads over to Elisha's house to kill him. But when he gets there, Elisha gives him a word from God. This is found in chapter 7, verse 1. Elisha replied, Hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. About this time tomorrow, a sea of the finest flour will sell for a shekel, and two seahs of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. Now, I'll explain this a little bit better in a minute, but for, for now, you just need to know those prices are really cheap. 
You'd have to have a huge abundance of food in order for food to be that cheap. And so the king and his soldiers don't even believe Elisha. In verse 2, the officer on whose arm the king was leaning said to the man of God, Look, even if the Lord should open the floodgates of the heavens, could this happen? In other words, there's no way food could be that cheap. They don't believe Elisha, but at least they go away without killing him. And then the story shifts, and we learn about four new characters who are even worse off than the poorest people in the city. Verse 3, it says, Now there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate. They said to each other, Why stay here until we die? If we say, We'll go into the city, the famine is there, and we will die. And if we stay here, we will die. So let's go over to the camp of the Arameans and surrender. If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, then we die. At dusk, they got up and went to the camp of the Arameans. When they reached the edge of the camp, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the Arameans to hear the sound of chariots and horses and a great army, so that they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired the Hittite and Egyptian kings to to attack us. So they got up and fled in the dusk and abandoned their tents and their horses and donkeys. They left the camp as it was and ran for their lives. The men who had leprosy reached the edge of the camp, entered one of the tents, and ate and drank. Then they took silver, gold, and clothes and went off and hid them. They returned and entered another tent and took some things from it and hid them also. So these four lepers go to the camp of the enemy, and they make a huge discovery that the enemy has fled, leaving everything behind, not just food and drink, but gold and silver and clothing. This is amazing. It's unbelievable. This is like winning the lottery a hundred times over. This is like going to the doctor who has told you you have inoperable cancer and you have a, a week to live, But then you go back to him and he says, oops, I made a mistake. You're fine. You're going to live for a long time. And and by the way, you know, since I made a mistake here, I'm going to give you a hundred thousand bucks to make up for it. This is like unbelievable. It's going from death to abundant life in a moment's time. And so the four lepers are celebrating and they're partying and they're stockpiling all the loot and hiding it away. And, And then they said to each other, what we're doing is not right This is a day of good news, and we are keeping it to ourselves. If we wait until daylight, punishment will overtake us. Let's go at once and report this to the royal palace. And so they go back to the city, but they can't get past past the the gatekeepers because they're lepers. Lepers aren't allowed into the city. And so they tell the gatekeepers the good news, and somebody goes running to the king with good news. But a funny thing happens. The king doesn't believe them. Have you ever heard a piece of news that is just so absolutely great that you didn't even believe it? I mean, it's it's just too good to be true. The king says, no way. There has got to be a catch. That cannot be true. Verse 12, the king got up in in the night and said to his officers, I'll tell you what the Arameans have done to us. They know we are starving, so they've left the camp to hide in the countryside thinking they will surely come out and then we'll take them alive and get into the city. And so the king hears this news. He says, it is too good to be true. It's got to be a trick. And I am not going to fall for this. I'm not going to end up looking like a fool. So what if I'm desperate? So what if if the the city is starving to death? I'm not going to believe that. And, And so he rejects the good news that they can be saved. But one of his officers says, King, yeah, I, I know this sounds too good to be true. I, I know it's hard to believe. But, but if just by some amazing chance it really was true, shouldn't we at least check it out? I, let me send a, a few of my men just to take a look. I mean, worst case scenario, the men get killed. Hey, we're all dying anyway. What can it hurt? And so verse 16 Uh, So it says they did send a few men, and they find out it is true. The good news is true. In verse 16 it says, Then the people went out and plundered the camp of the Arameans, so a seah of the finest flour sold for a shekel, and two seahs of barley sold for a shekel, as the Lord had said. 
Now, a sea of flour weighed about nine pounds. I mean, we don't use that measurement nowadays. You don't you know, buy your, your bags of flour and seas. But it was about nine pounds. So now your shekel could buy, or your 80 shekels could buy, not just a donkey's head, but about 750 pounds of flour. In other words, food was dirt cheap, just like God had said it would be. This was an unbelievable miracle. Now, what can we learn from this story? You know, whenever I read a story out of the Old Testament in particular, the first thing I ask myself is, why did God put this into his book? Because, you know, the Old Testament covers a period of thousands of years. There are a lot of stories that never made it into the book. So why did God put this one into, a book, into his book? And this story is loaded with meaning. In fact, there's a bunch of parallels between this story and the mission that God has given to you and me today. There's a bunch of ways in which you and I are like those four lepers who got blessed and then had some good news to share. So what do we see in this story? The first thing we see is this. These lepers were desperate. And they realized they had a desperate need. The first time we see them, they're sitting not in the city, but at the gates outside of the city. They're not inside because they're lepers. They can't go into the, into the city. And so they are actually worse off than the poorest people in the city. They don't even have the option of buying a donkey's head for 80 shekels, even if they had 80 shekels, which they don't. And so they were more desperate than the poorest people in the city. And what's interesting to me is that when God wanted to do this miracle, and when he wanted to bring this really good news of salvation, what did he look for? He looked for the most desperate people in all of Samaria to help bring about this miracle. How does that apply to you and me? The truth is that apart from God, you are desperate. I am desperate. Everybody that we have ever seen or ever do see is desperate. Now, this is one of the hardest things for us to accept because most of the time, we don't look desperate, do we? We don't feel desperate, do we? You know, most of the time we look around, we feel like we're doing fine. We're doing okay and the people around us, they, they look like they're doing fine. They're doing okay. They're, they're not desperate, right? Oh, I've got problems here and there. Everybody has problems. But I, I'm certainly not desperate, right? Let's watch a short video. I'm in debt. I have two car payments four years into a 30-year mortgage, balances on a couple credit cards, plus college for three kids on the horizon, zero savings. I work long hours at a job that I hate, and despite all that, all I get is stress about how I can make more money. I take four pills at night for my back pain. Some days, getting up seems like too much. I struggle with dyslexia. I have high cholesterol. I overeat a little too often. I'm trying to get in shape. But it's never, I mean never enough. My dad died five years ago from cancer. I should have seen him more before he passed. Man, I miss him so much. Everyone expects me to be over it. But it's something that I still deal with daily. I haven't taken my wife on a date in four months. I practically forgot our anniversary. My kids need me when I get home. But it's late. I want to sleep. I spend my weekends at their functions. As if that's enough. All this, and I still resent my family. Because I have no time just for me! I can be amazingly selfish. I'm often angry, seemingly, for no reason. I struggle with lustful thoughts, none of which my wife understands. Nor do I, for that matter. I'm good at some things, I'm great at nothing. I had dreams for my work and my family, and I abandoned them long ago. I think I'm a realist, and I come off as a pessimist. I feel restless knowing something is missing. I have too many burdens. They're suffocating. And this is the weight I carry. As many problems as as this guy in the video, or or maybe some of your problems are worse than than his are. 
But the point is that this guy in the video looks like he's doing just fine until he starts to talk and share what's on his heart, right? And, and then we see below the surface, we see the weight that he's carrying. The truth is all those people around you that look like they're doing fine, all of them are carrying a weight that most of the time you never even see. They're carrying an enormous weight that you can't see because they try to hide it. But the truth is, everybody you know, everybody you see each day, everybody you work with or go to school with or, or the neighbors around you, everybody has a desperate need for God, whether they realize it or not. Without God, they are lost. They are on their way to eternal separation from God. They may look okay on the outside. They may tell you they're just fine. They may say, I don't need God. They may tell you they don't need anybody. They may tell you that they love their life just the way it is, but they are completely deceived because the truth is they are desperate. They are in a hopeless situation with no way out apart from, from a relationship with God. And unless something changes, they will spend all of eternity regretting the day they were born. They're desperate. These four lepers actually had a big advantage. They realized it. They realized they were desperate. And that led to the next thing that we notice about them. Because they were desperate, the lepers developed a go-for-broke attitude. They're sitting at the city gates, and they say to themselves, hey, let's weigh our options. Option A, we could stay here at the gate, and if we do that, we're going to die. Option B, we could try to go into the city, and and there's a famine there, and and so even if they did let us in, which they probably wouldn't, but we're still going to die along with the rest of them. Or option C is the scary option. Option C is we could go to the enemy camp. And they might kill us if we do. But they might not kill us. And if we don't, then we'll live. So let's review our options. Option A, 100% death. Option B, 100% death. Option C, 50-50. Let's roll the dice. Let's go for option C. Let's go to the camp of our enemy. It's, It's scary. We're a little afraid. But really, what do we have to lose? If it doesn't work out, the worst that can happen is we die. We're going to die anyway. So let's do it. They overcame their fear, and they went. When it comes to sharing the good news and telling another person about your faith in Christ, do you know what the number one factor is that prevents people from telling other people? It's fear. What are they going to think about me? You know, what if they reject me? What if they think less of me because of of what I tell them? You know, the number one reason that blocks people is fear. So let's just take a second to do what the the lepers did, weigh our options for a second. If you decide to share your faith, have a spiritual conversation with your neighbor across the street, option A is maybe they're interested, at least a little. You know, maybe they say, well, tell me more about that. Or, or maybe they say, you know, that's, that's interesting. I, I need to think about that more. And your friendship deepens because you've had a, a good discussion, and they, they take one step on their journey toward God. Maybe their eternal destiny has changed, and you're able to be a part of that. That's option A. And the truth is, if you have actually developed any kind of friendship with them, if you've invested anything into that friendship, then the chances are they probably are going to be very open to talking about God. Why? Because most people in our society are really interested in spiritual things. If you don't believe me, why would our top magazines put God on the cover time after time? If you look at this uh, next slide, you see all of these examples. This is Time Magazine. What does science tell us about God? The, the God gene. Does God want you to be rich? Where did God go? God and women. One nation under God. Finding God in the dark. Is God coming back to life? Uh, you know, time after time, you know, our, our best-selling news magazines are putting God on the cover. Why would they do that? Because people are interested in God. Now, they may not want to go to church with you. That's a little different thing. But they're interested in God. And sometimes you talk to somebody and, and you have no idea, but they are just ready to say yes. Have you ever 
run into situations like that. I, I have time after time. Somebody I had no idea was even interested in God is, is just waiting for somebody to talk to them about God. And, and the moment I start, they, they say, well, yeah, how, how do I come to know him? You know, they're just ready. That's option A. That's the best case scenario. What's the worst case scenario? You tell somebody about your faith in Jesus and they kill you. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot. The, this isn't Afghanistan, is it? This, this isn't Iran. I mean, there are, are some places in the world where they might kill you if you tell them about your faith. But not in the U.S., do they? You know, here in the U.S., your worst case scenario is probably they're going to say, no thanks, not interested. But they usually don't kill you. You know, you usually don't uh, lose your job. They don't toss you in prison or, or torture you. They just say, no thanks, not interested. And that's probably the worst thing that's going to happen to you in the U.S. I uh, picked up a hitchhiker one time, and a guy who, young guy who looked like he'd lived a really hard life, and, and uh, I started talking to him about spiritual things, told him about my faith in God, and and. I'll never forget how he responded because he said, I know I'm going to hell, and I don't care. I'm fine with that. Surprised me a little, but that was just his way of saying, no thanks, I'm not interested. Now, you know the amazing thing about this is that one incident didn't devastate me. That one incident didn't make me go find a psychiatrist and get some Prozac for my deep depression. You know, I didn't wake up trembling from nightmares due to that horrible rejection. And when he said, I'm not interested, I just said, okay, and I dropped it. And that was the worst case scenario. But let me add something to that. That night when I went to bed and my head hit the pillow and and you know i i talked to god for just a minute before going to sleep at least i could say god i tried to obey you i tried to to do what you want us to do i i shared my faith and and i don't know if that guy will ever remember a single thing i said i don't know if it'll lead to anything at all but god at least i did something at least i obeyed you the lepers had a go for broke attitude they asked hey what's the worst that could happen Let's go for it. What's the next thing that we notice? Number three, the lepers rejoiced in their blessings. Once they get inside the enemy camp, they discover there's all this loot, and they immerse themselves in the riches they found. They're stuffing their face with food. They're guzzling the drinks. They're hiding away the silver, and they're trying on the clothes, and they can't believe their haul. They can't believe how lucky they are and what a treasure they've found. There's a parallel here as well. We also have a treasure. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have a huge treasure. John, uh, uh, Jesus says in John 10, verse 10, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. If you read the Bible, it tells us what's included in this more abundantly. Here's just some of the things that <clears throat> the Bible says it includes. And I've, I've listed some of these references on your outline. God says, if if you follow me, here's what I give you. A clear conscience, life and peace, help with weakness, purpose, confidence, security, power and strength, fulfillment, freedom. And it goes on. That's just the beginning of the list. There's a lot more that God promises to his children. And if that wasn't enough, when I die, I have the promise that death will not have the last word. And I will get to share an eternity with God, an eternity of unimaginable joy and peace and love and delight with the God who loves me and cares for me so much. You see, as believers, we have a lot to celebrate. We have a treasure that's far greater than anything that those lepers found. Now, the lepers were rejoicing in their treasure. So what should you and I be doing? Did you know that the Bible commands us to celebrate? It commands us to live joyful lives. It, it tells us, rejoice in the Lord always. Always, continually, all the time. We're supposed to be having a party because of this treasure that we have received. So, are you rejoicing? Are you rejoicing as you live your life? If you are really aware of your treasure, and you're rejoicing in it, 
then you'll want to tell other people, hey, come see the treasure that I've found. It is unbelievable. You've got to get in on this. If, on the other hand, I'm a Christian, but I'm, I'm just kind of going through the motions, doing it out of obligation, and I, I really have no joy or peace, and I'm not celebrating God's goodness to me. And instead, I'm pretending to be religious, and I'm, I'm kind of self-righteous, walking around with a frown on my face, looking like I ate too many prunes. You know, <clears throat> if that's the way that you're living, then why would I want to invite anybody else to live a miserable life like that? And why would anybody else want that so that they can be miserable like I am? You know, if that's the kind of life that you're living, honestly, if, if you're kind of a, living a miserable, hypocritical Christian life, then please do not tell anybody that you're a Christian. You know, take the bumper sticker off your car. You know, what's the next thing that we see from this story? The lepers thought beyond themselves. The lepers are celebrating their great treasure, and then all of a sudden they think beyond themselves. And this is actually the key point of the whole story right here. These lepers are piling up their their, uh, treasure, they're eating and drinking, they're partying, they're uh, stashing away the loot. All of a sudden, one of the guys stops, and he starts to think. Then he stands up and he says, wait a minute. Wait a minute, guys. What we're doing is wrong. The upper le- other lepers say, well, what do you mean wrong? We, we rolled the dice. We took the risk. We, you know, it, it paid off. It's wonderful. We're, we're so blessed. What do you mean wrong? The first leper says, you know what? There is a whole city of dying people right next to us. Yesterday, we were those dying people. Yesterday, we were the ones who, who couldn't even afford a donkey's head, you know, even if we had 80 shekels. We were starving at the city gate. Now, we're here at this treasure. But just because things are okay for us doesn't mean things are okay. He says, this is a day of good news. We have to share it. And then they go even farther and say, if we're silent, we will be found guilty If we wait, punishment will overtake us. We've got to go. We've got to tell. Now, remember, this story is about how you and I should handle the treasure that God has given us, the treasure of salvation, the good news. And it's clear that keeping it to ourselves is not an option. It is not okay. We are going to be held accountable. And in fact, as you study the Bible, you find there is one thing that Jesus never, ever said. Not to anybody, not at any time, not in any place. Jesus never came along to anybody and said, you know, you're doing pretty good on your own. I think you're going to make it without God. I think you're doing just fine. No, Jesus never, ever said that. Not to anybody, no matter how smart they were, no matter how rich they were, no matter how successful they were, he never said that. Because Jesus knew that apart from God's loving uh, love and grace, every human being he saw was guilty, desperate, and hopeless. He knew that human beings were in such bad shape that he had to even die for them to rescue them. And we cannot lose the sense of urgency that Jesus had. People that we know and that we love have no hope without Jesus Christ. We cannot just ignore that. Here I am, Lord. I don't want to walk by myself and pack on a burden I'm not required to carry. I want to do this in your power, your strength, because honestly, I love you. So I'm asking, how do I do this? How do I overcome my fears and reach out to my neighbor? How do I evangelize in my sphere of influence? I'm willing. I mean, if Tom needs a truck to move, he can use mine. 
Cheryl's patio is falling down. I I've got a bunch of tools. I'll build her a new one. I'll spring for the lumber. Or if Jack still wants to visit Aunt Betty in North Dakota, I'll buy him a ticket. I want to love them, and not just with words, but action. You say you've come to seek and to save the lost, to give them life and life to the full. And I've tasted that, so I pray for your life to be part of their life. And I pray that I could play a part of giving that. This neighborhood, this community, it's my mission field, right? But I don't know where else to begin, so I'm praying here. I want to serve you with my entire life. So here I am, Lord. Send me. There's one last thing that we see in the story of the lepers. Number five, the lepers were not in control of how people responded to the good news. Sometimes you take a risk, sometimes you roll a dice and you share the good news, tell somebody, and nothing happens. And that can be discouraging. The lepers experienced that at first. They say, this is a day of good news. They go tell everybody, and the king hears it, and he doesn't believe. He rejects the good news. The king says, it's a trick. It's too good to be true. I don't believe it. I'm not going to be suckered into this. And sometimes people respond that way to good news. The lepers were not in control of how people responded. They just knew that no matter how people responded, they had no choice. They had to share the good news. And in fact, Jesus tells us what to expect when we share the good news. He told a story. He compared it to a farmer who went out to plant some seed. But this farmer wasn't very careful about it. He just scattered seed everywhere, all over the place. And some of the seed fell on hard ground and, and nothing happened. Some of the seed fell in the middle of thorns, and it, it grew up and got choked out. Some of it fell on rocky soil and, and just withered away. But some of it fell on good soil. And then it took off and shot up and produced a hundred times as much seed. Now, what would have happened if the farmer had gone out and planted one seed and it happened to land on hard ground and, and nothing happened, and then the farmer said, you know what, this is just not working. You know, I, I'm discouraged. I threw down a seed. It's just wasted, and, and I'm not doing this anymore. Forget it. And so he just went home and sat on the couch and watched soap operas and ate potato chips. He wouldn't be much of a farmer, would he? The farmer's job is to sow a bunch of seeds, and, and some won't come up, but some will. The outcome is in God's hands. We can't control outcomes. Our job is just to sow the seed. I'd like the worship band to come up for a closing song. As they come up, you know, think for a moment about how these lepers felt after they spread the good news. And they see all these people that have been saved, all the people that are now celebrating this treasure, all those people who thought they were going to die, but now they've been saved, now they have new life. Think about how this little group of lepers, looking at all these people rejoicing, how they felt. And, and, and they're saying, man, I am so glad we didn't just sit on the treasure. I am so glad we didn't just keep it to ourselves we saved a lot of people today and if you're a follower of christ you have the a fabulous treasure just like they do and one day you're going to see jesus and he's going to have the ultimate treasure for you and me and here's what he's going to say to some of us hopefully he'll say it to all of us but he'll at least say it to some of us he's going to say i love the way that you cared enough to tell people about me I love the way that you cared for people who were poor and oppressed and hurting. I love how you prayed for people who were desperate, even the ones who looked so successful on the outside and didn't even know how desperate they were. I love your go-for-broke attitude that, that you took a risk and you talked to these people. I love that you decided that even though your treasure was wonderful, that you weren't going to just sit there and keep it all to yourself, but you decided to go out and share the good news and share the treasure. I love that you didn't let rejection hold you back from doing that. And most of all, I love how you lived a life that was so rich and joyful that other people wanted to get in on the good news because you were rejoicing in your treasure. That's what Jesus is going to say to some of us. 
I hope he says it to me. I hope he says it to you. Let's stand for prayer. (laughs) Heavenly Father, we thank you for the treasure that you have given us. We thank you for your blessings and provision and freedom and love and joy and peace. Thank you that we're going to spend eternity as part of your loving family. God, you have blessed us with such a great treasure. Would you help us to share that treasure with everyone around us? Would you help us to love our neighbors as ourselves? We pray this in Jesus' name.